um, pleased to introduce Vova and Ravi from Box, who are going to be talking about uh, securing Redis clusters. Thanks, guys. So, uh, as I've been introduced, my name is Vova Galchenko, and I run database and cache infra team at Box. Uh, together with my colleague Ravi, we're going to talk about securing, or the work that we're doing to secure Redis clusters at Box. So, we're going to organize this talk as follows. Um, to start with, I'll tell you about Box and how we use Redis clusters to begin with. Then I'll talk about security features that, are, that Redis cluster ships with. Ravi then is going to introduce the secure Redis, or secure Redis proxy, which is basically a tool that we use at Box to bridge the security gaps that Redis ships with by default. Uh, and finally, Ravi is going to talk about sort of the op operational char characteristics of uh, the secure Redis proxy in practice. So let's get started. So at Box, our mission is to power how the world works together, and we do that by providing a secure and robust platform for managing, accessing, and collaborating on your content. Over 85,000 businesses use Box, and they challenge us every day on a, on, on a, to, to, to essentially build infrastructure that can support their diverse and demanding use cases. As I mentioned earlier, I run the database and cache infra team, and our charter is to provide highly available, consistent, performant and easy, easy to use infrastructure for online transaction processing. And we rely on Redis in part to fulfill our goals. And before we dive into the security stuff, let, let me do like a really quick uh, survey of how we use Redis to begin with. So we use Redis for two kinds of use cases. Uh, in most cases, we use Redis cluster as a cache. And these are use cases that are uh, sort of transient data use cases, uh, they require fast access, access uh, and generally speaking, these are use cases where data is synchronized with an external source of truth. Uh, there's also use cases uh, for Redis set box where uh, we use it as a source of truth or a system of record. Uh, and then these use cases require persistence, they require redundancy of data, they also require the data store to uh, allow for handling of diverse uh, access patterns. So the, the source of truth uses of Redis at Box are fairly uncontroversial. Um, these, these are use cases that are similar to uh, what you'd find on the Redis website or elsewhere on the internet, of how people usually use Redis as a, as a, data, uh, as a uh, source of truth. Basically, we just use sorted sets as for indexing and then strings and hashes to store the data, so nothing really new there. However, I do get an odd number of questions, uh, this is surprising, uh, about our, our, our joint use of Redis and memcached for caching. So let's, uh, I'll go through a quick uh, case study. So one of the major services that, that my team owns is this uh, relational data access service. Um, and all products and features that are built at Box rely heavily on this service to, 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 as a backing data store, essentially. But behind the scenes, the service relies on MySQL, Redis, and Memcached uh, to, to basically relies on those technologies uh, to help provide its API. Uh, now, if this were a presentation that I was doing for a new hire at Box or at, at, on my team, uh, three times out of five, uh, at this point, I would get a question like the following, like, surely having both Redis and Memcached is just a temporary state and you must be migrating from, from uh, Memcached to Redis. Um, and the other two times, by the way, it'll be the guy who's assuming we're migrating from, from Redis to Memcached. So it's like, based upon my experience, it seems like half the industry is moving from Redis to Memcached and the other half is moving from Memcached to Redis. But we're actually doing neither. Uh, we're keeping both permanently. Uh, and let me explain. So if you think of technologies of being on uh, the following spectrum. So on the left side, we have uh, technologies with basic APIs. On the right side, right? Yeah, it's the right side. Uh, we have technologies with uh, rich APIs. Uh, of course, generally, you pay for the API richness in performance consistency as well as uh, operational simplicity. So we see Memcached and MySQL as sort of occupying the left and right sides of the spectrum, respectively. Uh, so indeed, you know, if you take Memcached, it's a pretty Spartan API. Uh, it does uh, very few things, but it does them really, really well, and it's uh, performance is consistent. It's pretty bulletproof. On the other hand, MySQL, you have 
the entire SQL language at your disposal. It's a very, very rich API. However, you generally have to build mountains around it to make sure it doesn't fall over, right? So on this spectrum, we see Redis as sitting in the middle between memcached and, and MySQL. Uh, so yeah, generally speaking, we prefer to use a technology that's as far on the left as possible uh, as long as it fulfills our use case. Um, and there are actually several advantages that Redis has over memcached for caching. So I'll, I'll go through a specific example. Uh, so one of the things that that service that I referred to earlier does is it caches relationships between objects. Uh, and so for each relationship, we need to differentiate uh, cache values by relationship facets. And I'll, I'll go through what that means in a second. Uh, but we also must be able to clear all facets of a single relationship quickly. So let's go through an example. Uh, let's say we have a box folder D that has three files in it, A, B, and C. Uh, these are the modified, last modified dates. These are the file sizes. Um, an application may want to look up D's contents uh, as ordered by file name, and in which case the result would be A, B, and C. Uh, they may also look up uh, D's files ordered by uh, last modified date, in which case the result would be C, B, and A. And then finally, they may look up folder D's files larger than 100 kilobytes in ordered by size. So you can see in here, it's a single relationship from folder D, basically folder D being the parent, files being the children. But we're sort of, uh, we need different facets of this relationship, right? So there's the ordering and filtering are two different facets that are presented in this case. Uh, and we need to cache those separately. So for memcached, this is a pretty tough challenge because there's uh, sort of, we need to be able to access stuff on a, you need to be able to access a specific section of your cache while being able to still invalidate the whole thing uh, quickly. And that's not something memcache is very good at. However, this fits really nicely into uh, Redis's hash data structure. Uh, so, yeah, so basically what we do at Box is we have a key, single key for this relationship uh, that basically identifies this folder ID uh, D, and then it has uh, the relationship name in this case, which is files, uh, and then the value would be a hash. And basically all we do is just create a key per relationship facet, uh, or a sub-key per relationship facet. So there's, uh, this would be the ordered by uh, file name, relationship and you can see the values A, B, and C. And then similarly for a different ordering, there's a sub key. And then finally for the both the filter and the order, uh, there's its own sub key. Uh, so while we generally use memcached for simple, simple key value caching use cases, the scenario, the case I described over here is like one of the cases where uh, Redis can be more suitable in, in caching situations. Uh, additionally, actually Redis's Lua support is really nice, uh, it, pro it provides really convenient synchronization, or it, it allows you to build in your own uh, synchronization primitives uh, that allow for performant ways for you to keep caches, caches in sync with uh, the system of record without sacrificing cons consistency. But that's kind of, uh, that's a side, maybe it's for a different talk, but uh, let's talk about security. So, uh, because some of the world's most productive enterprises use Box and they're, they're sort of relying on Box to store and manage their content, uh, some strict security and compliance requirements are attached to everything we do. In particular, access to every data store must be authenticated and encrypted and credentials must be rotated regularly. And this applies to both uh, cache systems and uh, sy system of record uh, systems. So when we were looking at using, box, or using Redis at Box, uh, we started with a security review, and uh, we'll go through some of the security options that are available in Redis. So the first thing we stumbled upon is the Redis website itself, which is pretty explicit about its philosophy on security. Um, so Redis is designed to be accessed by trusted clients inside trusted environments, is one quote. Another quote is that Redis is not optimized for maximum security, but for maximum performance and simplicity. Now, of course, our Redis clusters are never uh, publicly accessible to the internet, but even so, we employ a zero trust policy even within our, our data centers. So as you might imagine, uh, Redis' stance on security is not exactly inspiring confidence in our security team. So we started looking to see what we can do to bridge, bridge the gap. 
Uh, the very first idea that we thought of, of course, is client-side encryption. Basically, we expect the application to encrypt the stuff before it puts it into Redis and then send it over to Redis encrypted over a plain TCP connection. That helps to some degree, but has several problems. Uh, for one, key rotation is problematic in cases where you use Redis as a data store. Basically, you'd have to go through your entire cor corpus of data and re-encrypt everything. Um, and if you want to do this regularly, that's not exactly a breeze. Uh, this scheme also doesn't protect us against a malicious actor corrupting the data set. So if anybody can just connect to, to our Redis cluster and like issue uh, delete commands or basically set some values in there, there's nothing in this scheme that's necessarily protecting against that. It also, to some degree, prevents effective use of ordered uh, data types like sorted sets. Uh, especially if you want to encrypt this, this, this core, uh, or you know, in some cases people use this core as the geo geospatial uh, scores, uh, and so encrypting that obviously breaks ordering. Um, and yeah, this strategy can be pretty effective for Redis as a cache use cases. Uh, however, we looked into Redis features deeper to see if we can, if there's anything we, that could provide a more general solve for Redis security. So encryption, uh, Redis doesn't natively support it. However, tunneling solutions such as S-Tunnel and S-Pipe D are generally recommended. On the authentic authentic authentication front, the story is maybe a little more inspiring. Uh, there are two configuration directives, uh, require pass and master auth. Uh, that allow setting a single password to protect access to the cluster. So it kind of sounds like it might help. However, upon a little thinking about this, uh, you realize that this is of very limited utility. Uh, and the problem is with key rotation or password rotation. Uh, so for one, in order to, for the cluster to operate, continue operating as we rotate passwords, you have to somehow magically synchronously rotate passwords across the entire fleet. And what's more, cluster clients would also have to rotate the passwords synchronously with the cluster, uh, which is like we weren't ready for this kind of synchronized swimming <laughs> at Box. And so with that, uh, here's Ravitesh to talk about, uh, to introduce the security or the secure Redis proxy that we built to encrypt and authenticate Redis cluster traffic. Hello, everyone. Um, how many people here would like to see some security from Redis as such? Oh, a lot of people. How many people have built anything on top of their Redis infrastructures to secure their systems? Nobody. Nice. So we at Box are, have give very high importance to our security infrastructures. And at every level of our services, we put a big checkpoint on security. So as Lova explained before, how, how, uh, how, the, how the security point in Redis is so low important, and they haven't given so much importance to that feature. So as engineers, it's our responsibility who are using these services need to build something, some kind of services on top of it to provide more and mo more security to our infrastructures. Inbox, Redis caches store a lot of data which is very important to customers and any, any security breach in this is not acceptable at any grounds. So without missing too much time, let me dig into the goals of our system. So primarily, what are our primary you know, our goals? First, we need to provide authentication. So authentication should be like every, only the authorized user should be able to access the data from their Redis servers. And these passwords should be rotated as per the security compliance team's requirements. And then, if possible, you need to encrypt the connections between the clients and the Redis server so that nobody can snoop the data and get the data from the system. So, so to perform all these operations, one of the important things that we also need to consider here is you should not break the primary purpose of the Redis servers. One is simplicity and performance. So we put ourselves goals like when we are, when we are solving these problems of authentication and encryption, the latency impact should not be should not be over two milliseconds, 
and no downtime is expected when the proxy is deployed or upgraded. So since so many people are trying to use the caches, there always are at least 15 to 20K number of connections connected to our Redis servers. And any downtime causing in this system would break the whole thing and it would cause a big havoc, havoc in the whole environment. So no downtime expected when you're deploying and working on these proxies and minimize the changes for existing clients. So existing clients should not be aware of something proxy being deployed on the system in the infrastructure. They should be working as if they are directly contacting the Redis servers, and the proxy would take care of all the, all the in, in, internals and, and deal with the authentication and have, have more security to the system. So protecting the infrastructure with the above features should not, should not take away the simplicity and, uh, and, the, and the performance of our Redis structures. That's the primary goals. So let's go into the simple architecture. What do we have? We have, I, I stripped down the whole thing into a single machine. Uh, there's a host and there is a Redis instance running on it. Yet they are listening on an external NIC and now the Redis servers are being, Redis clients are talking to the Redis servers you know, you from, uh, to the external NIC, which is a standard for 6379. So they, they make a connection to the external NIC, the, listener, the Redis instance is listening on it, and they get the request and the answer and the, and the response is received by the clients. So what did we do? So there is a, there's a feature, there's a, there's a provision in Redis instances where you can actually also listen on a Unix socket. So we, we enabled that feature so that Redis instance starts listening on the Unix socket too. We deployed a service called the secure proxy on the host that is talking to the Unix socket, talking to the Unix socket to actually talk to the Redis instance. And it's also listening on the loopback address. When Redis clients try to talk to the external NIC, we do an IP tables forwarding that packet is transferred from the external lake all the way to the loopback address. And at the loopback address, the proxy is listening, which snips all these packets, reads the information, what's there in it, and then does the appropriate action on it, and then transfers them to the Unix socket and takes the data from the Redis server. So that's how the whole flow of events happens, and we get to look at all the packets that go through the proxy. But what did we solve? We just transfer data from here to there and then taken care of from the secure side. We haven't dealt with the security. Where are the passwords? So now there is something called Secure Vault. Secure Vault is a separate service provided by external companies or there are any, some companies even have it in their, their own pre-built systems where they store all their passwords. And the processors or the clients would go and talk to the, to, the, to the vault and get the password and use the password to do any operation. So in this flow, uh, the Redis server, Redis clients would actually go and talk to the vault, get the password to talk to the cluster and make the connection to the external NIC on the Redis instances to, uh, to have an authentication. They use the simple Redis protocols authentication, pro uh, system, uh, authentication protocols and use that authentication to send the password and that password is being intercepted by the Redis proxy and the proxy would go and get the passwords from the secure vault, validate it, if it's okay, instead of going to the Redis servers, it would respond back to the client saying that, hey, you're authenticated, your connection is good, now you can make all the, all the, all the possible connection uh, commands after that. And subsequent commands are being made and they are being sent to the Redis server and they get the response and everybody's happy. So we have solved the security issue by having password and also having uh, also having clients talking talking to the talking to the vault and updating the passwords. So let's in this next section we would go and drill down into each and every part and see if we have solved all our initial goals or not. First scenario. So let's see if the passwords if if somebody does not send password does he how, how does it work? The clients is not aware of some password being existent in the system, so they try to send a get request, which it was doing previously, and they were happy with it. The secure proxy listens to it. Since no password was sent, disconnected. So it says, hey, you're, you're not supposed to go ahead with the Redis, uh, so you have failed out. The next section, we have the, the positive guy, where he's, he, he has the password. He first sends an auth request. 
since the auth proxy, uh, so, uh, secure proxy is the only guy who understands the password, it validates the password, responds back to the client saying that yes, you got it, you have a successful auth, your connection is secure, and now it makes a get command, and the get command is passed on to the Redis, and subsequently the response is passed back. So we solve the problem of authentication. The number two bullet we have in our goals is uh, password rotation. How do we solve it? Security uh, administrators decide to rotate the passwords each every time. So we have to be very much important, uh, uh, very much on the go to read all the passwords. So the auth prox uh, secure proxy uh, can read, the, uh, read and validate multiple passwords provided by the client. So when the, when the secure proxy boots up for the first time and subsequently, frequently every day or two, so it would go and get all the passwords which are available in the vault. But the clients are only able to get only one password at a time, use only one password at a time. So passwords are periodically rotated and recycled using the following procedure. So if a security administrator would decide to rotate the password, they would add the second password into the vault. The proxy would go and read that there are, there are two passwords in the system. It will start authenticating clients using both these passwords. And, uh, and the clients are notified to use the new password now. And the clients are, when, when the clients, have, all the clients have migrated to the new password, the server would say, okay, uh, the administrator would remove the old password and the old password is no more existent in the system and you have password rotation happened successfully and we have solved the second problem too. The third one, upgrades. It is usually when you do upgrades, you just go and restart the proxy and then you are all good to go. You just uh, kill the process or do a uh, graceful termination of the process and do a straight restart a new process so that new clients are being connected. That is not a case, not, not an option here. The sudden restart of the Redis proxy might, might, might cause a flood of reconnections from the clients from the, uh, to the Redis and might, might even cause a thundering herd problem. So that is not an option. So what do we do? So we deploy two proxies at any time. So second, first is the old one which is already accepting 15K number of connections and then we deploy the new version of proxy on the same host, and then we, 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 we send a command to, we, we do the IP tables change so that any new connections that are happening to the system will be happening to the new proxy instead of going to the old proxy. So now any new, all the new connections are transferred from the old proxy to the new proxy, and what about the old connections? So there are many long living connections, like the Java clients keep our long living connections, and they don't, since they are already made the connection, they don't get disconnected. So you have to gradually go and tell the old client, old proxy, to go and start disconnecting those servers so that they can do a reconnection and they would go to the new proxy. So that's how we solve the upgrade process by gradual disconnection and we have the whole upgrade smoothly happening with the new proxy running. Yes, did we solve the whole problem? Or did we? What about cluster communication? How many people here are aware of cluster communications in Redis? Very few, okay. Um, so let me give you a small background of cluster communication. So cluster communication is, the, there, are, there are masters and slaves in Redis servers, and these master slaves do, do special communications between them to, uh, to notify their status of existence and how are they connected, and at the same time, they also do replications from master to slaves. So these are many, uh, these are the some calls that happen um, between the clusters. But since we enforced auth on all the connections, when the slaves try to make a connection to the, to the masters, it's not possible, because it'll straight away reject the whole communication and the master slave system will be broken. So how did we solve it? So let's drill into how, what, are, what are the cl cluster communications happen. The first is the cluster bus communication. So there is a separate port other than the standard port where the cluster, cluster masters and slaves do communications. So that is to notify their existence, their ping, they, if something bad goes on to the master, master is not responding to the, in, in the quorum, so the, one of the slaves will automatically pick up to become the master. All that kind of communication has been happening on the, on the bus port. So that is, 
completely uh, secure because we uh, we don't we don't have any sensitive information around it. It's mostly based on the quorum and the cluster uh, cluster status and all those things. So we can actually keep that aside. We don't have to work on it. The second thing is the standard port communication. On a standard port communication, uh, the information is exchanged like replication data, which is from master to slave frequently. Those things are happening, which is very important for us. So the, the data is stored that we have is of users' data. So that data is flowing through the proxy, uh, through the uh, through the through the uh, master-slave communication for replication. And if you start blocking it, you're losing everything. So what do we do? One possible scenario here is one possible scenario here is if the if the if the connection is happening from the internal cluster client, you just bypass it. Don't do any kind of authentication. Just by say that, hey, you're good to go. Take whatever you want. Okay. So for that, to understand if we if, if we are doing it right, we have to first quantify the commands that we have in our system. So we have a bunch of Redis commands that are happening, like get, set, replication commands, the psync, uh, the info uh, cluster, all those commands. So we need to identify and put uh, classify these commands into separate buckets so that we know which commands need to be bypassed, which commands need to be authenticated, which commands need to be bypassed from cluster clients only, or something like that. So let's go with some information about command classification. Um, so we have, the we have the commands, we have classified into five buckets. One is the harmless commands, another one are the auth commands, and the internal Redis commands, and every other command that we have. Harmless commands. We have ping info, comma, info command, it's a command name, by the way, and it's an echo. They do not expose any user information. They don't perform any changes to the system. So we are good to go to let them go through. Second one are the auth commands. Auth command is the command to authenticate, and it's a standard Redis command to authenticate, so we are anyways looking at it, so we, have, we are being parsing it. Third one is the internal Redis commands. Internal commands, Redis commands, are the cluster commands which share the state of the connection between the nodes, as I explained before. So these are important ones which we need to be taken care of. Second, the fourth one are the, are the other commands, which are the get, sets, and cluster meets, and all those commands, which are very important. They do some uh, information exchange, and uh, the performance is, makes meaningful changes to the system. So the harmless commands, we can just pass through, go to, go to Redis, no authentication required. So th th the second one are the auth commands. The auth commands, we have to check the password, we set the authentication state of the connection based on the passwords available, passwords successful or not, and then we, 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 we pass through. The fourth section was the other command which need to be authenticated, so we go ahead, we check for the password, we, if the, we check if the connection was authenticated, and then we either pass through the Redis or we actually return it to return a forbidden response. So that's how we classified the three. And now to the important one, which is the internal Redis commands. What do we do with those? So we have to first identify if, if the connection is made by an internal Redis client or an external client. So how do we do that? We actually, we, we, can, we can talk to the Redis cluster, right? right? One of the Redis instances who's already part of the cluster. So we talk to it and get all the currently current existing uh, cluster, uh, cl current existing cl um, host in the system, and we see if this new connection that is being made, who is doing the uh, internal Redis commands, is it a part of the cluster or outside the cluster? And we solve the problem. We say that, okay, you're part of the cluster, you're supposed to do. I'm not waiting for you to see for authentication or anything. You're, you're straight to go ahead and do the, do the communication with the Redis server. So we did patch everything, right? Are we good? Nope, I don't think so. So let's see this scenario. We have the box as usual. We have the Redis instance. We have the proxy listen, proxy securing our Redis cluster. And it happens to be that the HC Ops guy has added, decided to add a new instance into the, into the, into the cluster. So he's trying to resize. So we, the, the way resizing works is it does a cluster meet command which happens on the cluster bus port. 
it is not being monitored as per our previous analysis. So we, ex we assume that everything that happens on the bus port is a happy path and they are secure communication because that only happens within the cluster. So that per proxy, the, the other instance would go and talk to the Redis instance on the, on the bus port and it, it becomes a trusted node into the cluster and every, that information is being shared with everyone inside the cluster saying, hey, there's a new node in the cluster and this is the service of the guy and you have to trust him. Now when the other node decides to do replication, it sends a replication command to the, Redis, uh, the secure proxy. The secure proxy, as we decided before, that if, if, the, if, the, secure if the internal Redis command is happening from an uh, internal uh, cluster system, you should pass through, right? So we decided, that, okay, let's go. It, we, let's ask our Redis instance. Redis instance is like, hey, it's already part of the cluster. And we did pass through. And, and it got all the data that needs to be part of the cluster. And then later we found out that that guy is the malicious guy. So he is the guy who is not part of any cluster, who should not be, who is not being introduced by our, by our ops team. He is a malicious process who's trying to pretend to be a Redis server and he's doing all the communication. So we thought that we solved all problems, we left a hole, the whole water is gushing out. How do we solve it? So we introduced a system called a Zookeeper. So we put all information about Redis instances inside the Zookeeper. When, a system, when, a, when, a, when the ops team decides to put any new node or resizing the cluster, they put this information inside the Zookeeper. The Zookeeper has a feature to notify anyone who's listening on a, on a location to, to inform that these changes have been made in, the, in that location. So it would inform all the Redis proxies that, hey, this location has changed, uh, the cluster is being resized, these are the new nodes in the system. So when a malicious guy tries to make a connection and he becomes part of the cluster using the back door and he does a replication command, we, we verify that node's validity by looking at the list of trusted nodes inside the zookeeper and the zookeeper would say, no, this guy is not a good guy. It would deny it. So hence, we have found a happy path and we have mostly solved all the problems as far as we have found. So hopefully, this marriage is going to be helpful and happy. So let's see how's the life after marriage is. <laughs> we have proxy is sitting on the Redis instance and it is guarding our Redis instance properly and it is working. Let's see how's the performance. The proxy is currently written in Golang. We have chosen this language because it's a pretty simple language and it's automatic memory management with a famously short garbage collection capability. So even though, um, so we, uh, we have it written and um, we, have it, we have it running in production right now. Uh, oops, sorry. We have it running in production right now. It's currently serving around 20K new connections per second per Redis host. Uh, currently having 15K concurrent connections per Redis host. Uh, in, our, in our setups, our Redis host can have multiple Redis instances. So one proxy is actually uh, guarding four or five Redis instances at the same time. So that's why you see so many connections happening on the system. So at a time, we, have, we, we are having around five GB per seconds of, uh, of data being flowing through the proxy at peaks. Some memory stats we have, uh, the heap size is running around less than 200 MB, so pretty good uh, for, the, for the amount of data that is being handled. Uh, 50 MB of allocation rate, and the 0.5 second of per GC pause that we have on the system. Some latency stats, uh, the latency stats are 0.5 millisecond latency overhead on the plane connection. We are currently working on the TLS connections. We have a good prototype working on our dev, dev systems. So once we have every testing done, we will put deploy on live and see how the performance is on the other side. So if you have, you know, some people might be questioning the number of the, the allocation rate over here when you have 5 GB of data coming, how, how are you having only 500 MB of allocation rate? So even though we, we read around 5 GB of data per second on the proxy, the allocation rate is so low, is because we use a 1 KB circular buffer for each connection. 
So we read the data from the stream on the connection into this buffer and immediately flush out to the underlying connection. No new allocations are being made uh, while performing reads on, the, on, 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 the, on this single connection. So, so that's the reason we have a very good allocation rate that helps us lower GC, uh, uh, lower GC pauses and the performance hits are not so high because of that. So looking at some graphs, so this is the time when we have it. Yeah, this is the time when we have deployed the proxy on uh, on on one of our clusters. And if you see the you see the latency graphs, it's pretty consistent. There's no change in the trend, the troughs and the and the peaks. Uh, it's around 0.66 to 0.82, so the, the graph stage. And uh, it's pretty it's pretty good. It's performing really well on on all our clusters. They are running it on mostly 70 to 80% of our clusters right now, and all our high performance clusters are, are being working on this proxy right now. All right, Q&A. Yes, sir. Uh, hiya. Hello, hello. Oh, I, do I have to hear something? I can hear you, it's okay. Oh, okay. Uh, I have two. Uh, the first thing is, uh, uh, the forced flush, I mean, uh, asking the other side to drain the uh, what is the mechanism for the uh, initiator to get a positive acknowledgement from uh, the uh, uh, the other side to make sure that uh, the draining already happened before everybody switch over to the new set of uh, passwords? That, that's the first question. The second question is the zookeeper. Will that become a single point of failure in the entire system? So I'll, I, can, I can start by addressing the Zookeeper thing. Uh -huh. uh, so Zookeeper is a system that's actually built to be uh, highly available. It's, it's basically, it's, it's not a single node. It's, a, it's, a, it's actually an abstraction for a bunch of nodes. Uh, and yeah, basically they, they handle this problem. It does, it does become, a, like the system as a whole becomes, uh, the Zookeeper system as a whole becomes a single point of failure. But it, Zookeeper itself is meant to be highly available. So it's a it's a cluster rather there's than a single host. Yeah, there's yeah. redundancy there. there. Yeah, and then this. Hmm? What if they hacked Zookeeper? So uh, do you mean they hacked in and they put the wrong information in there? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. I imagine Zookeeper is authenticated. Uh, access to it is authenticated. In yeah, there are some case. authentication mechanisms like Kerberos, SASL binds. Uh, they do have GSS API, pretty secure authentications for the for the zookeepers. Yeah, they're, they're it's all about authentication. Yes. Versus, sorry. Your proxy is about authentication too. Yeah. So pa so Zookeeper authentication is separate. So they support like standard authentication protocols like SASL. Uh, yeah, so yes, it can fail. Like any anything can fail, I guess. Uh, <laughs> our goal here is to basically make it as hard to fail as possible. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, and then the question was about... Dr Mm -hmm. Are you, oh, okay, so you basically, when you know that all the clients have switched over to the other password, so basically what we do is we provide a library that all our clients at Box use to access Redis, and so we have metrics. Like that library emits metrics and tells us who's using what password. Uh, also, we have similar metrics in the proxy. So the proxy itself will emit metrics on who's using which password. No, no, every, no, no. Every password has an ID associated with it, uh -huh. and the clients would be notified to use an uh, use a password initially, right? So uh, when when you when the, when, the, when when you want to update to a newer password, all the clients are notified to use the new password. On the proxy side, proxy knows which password is being used, and the metrics is emitted to the to the wavefront metrics saying that okay, for now password ID one has been used by. 10,000 clients, and gradually the graphs goes down for the password one, and the password two graphs goes up. 
the moment when you see the password one is used by none, you take out the password from the from the from the vault and it's it's yeah. gone forever. So it would be up to the operator, up to yeah. the like ops person who's doing the password rotation to watch the graphs and make sure that you know clients have switched over to using the, the new password. A human? A human, yes. I mean, no, a human you, has the, to admit it's a security. It's a security. So about you're confused, okay? There's no problem here, okay? Anyway, so why use client passwords if you don't have TLS? Why bother? We do have TLS. So the, no, you said it's in testing. Yes, it's in testing. But they, basically, the design includes TLS. We're working on uh, deploying that. Thanks. Do you know what other companies uh, have solved the similar problem? Um, as for any any other companies have solved a similar problem? Yeah, we googled around the internet. Uh, yeah, basically, yeah, there's like S Tunnel and S Pipe D is there for encryption, uh, and then I'm not aware of anything for multi-password authentication. We've yeah, we've uh, we've asked around. Uh, as far as I know, uh, nobody's doing that. Are you thinking of open sourcing this? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I don't know yet. Probably within, I would guess, probably like in a year or something like that. Because okay, okay. we want to abstract away all of the internal pieces. Okay. Yeah. So all, all the tools that we have seen outside were based, uh, were concentrated on how do I reduce the number of connections? How do I tunnel the whole communication between the client and the server? I haven't seen any solutions to enforce and add more multi-password support and key rotation. So when you do S5D, you have to make sure that the S tunnel takes care of all the all the all the termination, and then it does a connection back to the Redis servers. So that's again on the TCP. One of the important things that we have seen in the in the in the architectural diagram is that Proxy tries to make a Unix socket connection to the Redis servers. So that is in the latest benchmarks that I have seen, it is seven times faster than making a TCP connection. So. So that's the performance upgrade that you get when you use such kind of proxy making on, on a TC on a on a Unix socket layer. So the proxy dis deployment is it separate from the Redis deployment? It or is, is separate. It you attach to both. Two? In the puppet way, we do it attached. It doesn't have to be attached. Okay. Yeah. Because now when the cluster spins up automatically, the proxy will also come through. Yeah. Okay. Puppet. Yeah. Cool. Got it. Where's the person over there? Yes, there's a person over there. Over there. Oh, there's no way we'll hear this. Uh, so you use the same where? password. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so uh, you, you use the same password for all the clients, right? Yeah. So the question is, do we use the same password for all, all clients? Yeah. We use the same set of passwords for all clients, I guess. But at any one time, you know, there is one password for all the clients. Yeah. Uh, there's actually multiple passwords for all the clients. No, we are retiring the old password. Yeah, yeah. Basically, during the key, during the ma the password rotation, there are multiple passwords, and then eventually one of them prevails. So, how do you know if some bad guy got hold of the password? We don't, and that's why we do password rotations. Um, yeah, we don't yet support multiple uh, multiple user accounts, but it's something we may add in the future. But we do have multiple user accounts on different clusters. It doesn't have to be uh, same guy trying to access every all the, every cluster in the world in, in the box infrastructure. So if, if, if you want to talk to cluster A, you can use password A. If you want to talk to cluster B, you can use password B. Yeah. I'm sorry. So the password is per proxy. Yeah, yeah, per cluster. Per cluster. Per Redis cluster. Per Redis cluster. I think this is the last question. How do the clients communicate the password? So they they get a string, they have so to we, edit code, they put it in a config file. Like how does how do they get it, store it, pass it? Clients yeah. get the password, or clients use using the password to talk to Redis. Yeah. So. So both, right? You you said they're going to get a new password. Mm -hmm. It's communicated somehow. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> How do they get that information? Then what do they do with it? Do they have to update code that has to be compiled and deployed? They update a config file. Vault. So they're communicating with vaults. Yeah. Yeah. Vault they basically get the passwords from Vault, 
and then they send it over to the to Redis via the normal like standard Redis command, the auth command in the Redis protocol. Vault is a separate process. They have their own APIs to talk to. So we we provide the clients uh, all, all, uh, always have the path to look for. Where is the password? So the clients are notified that hey, look for the password here. So next time when the password changes, look for the password here. So now from the then on, when the clients try to make a connection, it use that new new path, get the new password, and then do the communication. So do you use your proxy to talk to one cluster, or can it is it is the proxy multi-cluster already? No, a proxy talks to one cluster, its own instance. Yeah, it's installed on the machine. It only talks to the instances which are running on the machine. It does not talk outside to in the cloud of the Redis instances. Okay. All right, well, um, thank you very much. Um, we're, we're out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.